All right, we're going to get started. It is 1130. Uh, that way we can get you guys all back, especially if you're joining us for your lunch break. So we appreciate everybody joining us again today. Uh, this is our fourth session in our Injury Prevention Autumn Series. Uh, we're going to be talking about staying safe in the backcountry. So this is a perfect um, segue from our last presentation on hiking. Uh, we're going to hear from Jesse Montgomery, Sophia Tuttle, and Darby Hart. Did Hart, I'm sorry, Darby, I did not mean to say that. I'm wrong. Um, they're going to give us a great presentation today. Uh, none of us have any disclosures to share with you, so we don't need to let anyone know of disclosures. So we want you to let you know a little bit of a change that might happen to this November 10th suicide prevention. Um, it will probably be pushed back to November 17th. Um, our present, presenter did have a family emergency that they're going to have to travel for. So hopefully we can get you guys in on that, get her in on the 17th. And we will let everybody know that's registered uh, the change in date on that. Anybody that knew that's registered will send out that communication. So, so watch for that change. All right, contact hour. So this does offer one uh, nursing contact hour. Uh, to get that contact hour, you do need to um, participate in the post-presentation poll. I'm going to launch this introduction poll just for everybody as we're just starting as well. Uh, but just make sure that you complete that end of presentation polling and then they will email you out the certificate for your nursing contact hour. If you're an EMT or paramedic and want to use this for recertification hours, you just submit this to your training officer and have them approve that for your hour as well. We'll kind of move on. I know that we talk about um, just upcoming education as well. So we have our uh, intimate partner violence education, primary prevention education series that will be coming up next week. Uh, we are into November 3rd, so we'll be talking about policies um, on sexual harassment and reporting. We're going to have a great presenter from the Utah Domestic Violence Coalition uh, presenting for that. And then on the 17th, we'll be uh, presenting, she'll be presenting as well, and we'll get into some good breakout sessions with some conversation. And December, we're going to be talking about resources and advocacy. So hopefully you can join us for that. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, we, we always like to share if you have not become um, in the burn crisis standards of care site, uh, please go on and, and register to be on that site. They have a lot of good education as well uh, that they offer out and a lot of good resources. And speaking of that, Annette, who is their outreach coordinator and awesome, will be presenting in our EMS grand rounds in December on environmental injuries. Uh, which brings us to our next slide. We have our trauma and EMS grand rounds, just so you guys know, they're always on. Uh, the third Thursday of the month or of every other month. So trauma ground rounds is uh, next month on November 19th. It's going to be on ophthalmic injuries. It's always from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. And then we always have our EMS ground rounds, which is uh, the second Wednesday of every other month as well. Trauma ground rounds is odd months. EMS ground rounds is even months. And that's from two to three on those days. Uh, so go ahead and watch for those. If you're not part of our email uh, distribution list, please let me know and I will add you to that so you will be able to get this communication that I send out every month as well. And I think, I think that's the last slide. Uh, reminder that November is Pedestrian Safety Awareness Month and Domestic Violence Awareness Month, um, Intimate Partner Violence. So uh, just promoting that and promote safety for you guys. And then I'm going to introduce really quickly um, our speakers. Uh, so just a little quick introduction for them. Oh, goodness, Sophia, I just misplaced that. Hey, we can introduce ourselves if yes, you want. Yes, please, because now I just pulled up and I had the email up and now I don't. We're all having technical difficulties today. Uh, if you ladies want to introduce yourselves, that would be great, and we'll turn the time over to you. Yeah, sure. So I'm Sophia, and I'm here with Jesse and Darby, and we're all on the Salt Lake County Search and Rescue Team. Um, I'm a medical student up at the U. Uh, Jesse and Darby, you guys want to introduce yourselves? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Jesse. I uh, am working as a medical assistant up at Primary Children's, but I do work for the University of Utah. Kind of funny collaboration there. Um, I have like an EMT certification, and like Sophia said, we're all search and rescue volunteers. My name is Darby DeHart. I am a master's degree and I am a, currently a paramedic. I work for the Center of Emergency Programs for the University of Utah. And just like earlier, we are also all team members for Salt Lake County Search and Rescue. Awesome, so I will start sharing and Darby is gonna get us started. So today our presentation is on safety in the shoulder seasons, some of the common injuries, prevention and management of those injuries. For me. 
Okay, so just the basic outline of the stuff that we're gonna talk to you guys about today. So we're gonna specifically talk about what exactly is the shoulder season, what type of injuries do we see, and what are the weird kind of interesting conditions that we see a lot of times that contribute to the injuries that we see a lot of time coming from our search and rescue background. After that, we're gonna talk about just the common things that anytime you're going and doing an outside activity or going into the back country or some good things to have in your pack. And then we'll have time at the end to ask any of your questions. Like it. <laughs> Okay, so what exactly are our shoulder season injuries? So a lot of times our actual so shoulder season is any time period between we're transferring from over from our summer, kind of our fall into winter seasons, as well as our winter coming more into spring. These times have variable differences in them because a lot of times we're actually transitioning over to more cold weather and more variable times that are happening. So we can have multiple things from random cold freezes, random bouts of precipitation, so random snowstorms, rain, okay, lots of ice freezing over, especially when we go to higher elevations. All these multiple different factors that contribute to multiple different types of injuries that we can see during these specific odd kind of weird wintry, summery spring time periods. And we see that will happen a lot, especially here in Utah where the weather changes every five minutes. Okay, that can happen, especially this week where we started the week out in the 80s and now we're in the 20s. Okay, so that's why we have a big, huge variable of injuries, especially in these shoulder seasons. Our most popular time for injuries is definitely in the summer because everyone's outside, but our second is definitely this shoulder season, just because there's so many variables that go on. And so with that being said, there's lots of different factors, lots of different injuries that we see in these places. Okay, ready to click it. Okay. So a lot of the more common ones that we end up seeing are the ones that we're gonna list here and the ones that we're gonna end up talking about. Just to have a kind of a side note here, our number one is actually ankle injuries. We had a week last week that was just ankle injury after ankle injury after ankle injury. But just knowing about all these other different factors that can actually feed into some of these injuries are a good thing to know. So the first one we're gonna end up talking about is just extremity injuries. Awesome. Thanks, Darby. So like Darby mentioned, um, by far, our number one call out every year is for ankle injuries or any kind of extremity injuries. So ankle injuries like sprains or strains is number one and then broken legs. Um, but I know you guys already talked about kind of hiking in general. And so I'm sure, you know, that's kind of the number one thing you see there. So we kind of wanted to go into a little more depth on why those injuries happen, um, how we treat it and some things you can do to kind of minimize your risk there. So um, why do we see so many extremity injuries, especially in the shoulder season? Well, there's lots of, um, you know, like Darby mentioned, kind of uh, contributing factors. So we've got this change in weather, change in conditions. Um, if you guys have been on the trails lately, you know, there's lots of leaves out. It's beautiful, but it's also great for covering up rocks that really love to uh, twist your ankles. So there's a little bit of bad luck in play here, right? Like you can't exactly control um, when you're going to twist your ankle, but there's some things that you can do. Um, to help prevent it. We talk a lot about appropriate footwear and um, layers in search and rescue because no matter what happens, even if it's just an ankle twist, you're probably going to be sitting for a really long time um, before anyone can get to you. You know, getting the team up on the mountain isn't a fast affair. And so when we look at extremity injuries, um, we kind of think of it, especially in the shoulder season, as the ankle injury isn't the problem that we're concerned about. It's the sitting out and being exposed for hours that's really going to um, have devastating consequences. So um, especially in the fall uh, during the shoulder season, we think about, okay, you're injuring your ankle, but then what's happening? You're sitting out for three, four hours, you're immobilized, you're not moving, you're getting cold, the weather is dropping, the days are shorter, um, so it's cold, it's dark, you don't have layers because you thought you're just going for a nice little hike to the Overlook Trail in Mill Creek, um, and suddenly you're sitting out overnight and it dropped to 30 degrees. And so, you know, we really think about um, kind of the progression of those extremity injuries in the fall, and that's really da the dangerous part. And so um, our approach to treatment and, you know, that anyone can apply when you're out hiking is, you know, say you twist your ankle, obviously you want to immobilize that injury, um, whether it's, you know, elevating it or just keeping it still. We have, you know, some nice fancy splints that we like or the air splint, um, the vacuum splint, the full body one, that's great too. It keeps you warm and stable. Um, but another thing you want to do even before search and rescue or help gets there is get that patient off the ground. The ground is cold, whether it's snow, whether it's just cold dirt, um, you know, have that person sit on the backpack, um, get them off that cold ground so they're not going to get colder even faster. And then, you know, like I mentioned, appropriate footwear. Um, and we'll talk about this a little more later, um, some specific tools that you can take with you. 
Um, think about your route, you know, are you going in, you know, on this ridge line that's going to be extra exposed and extra cold, like that's fine, just be prepared for it. Um, and then, you know, always layers, you know, be prepared to sit for a really long time because if something happens, if you get bad luck and twist your ankle, um, you need to be ready to sit and stay warm for a while until help can get there. So uh, some examples of this, we have, you know, hundreds of examples of extremity injuries, but this one uh, specifically happened during the shoulder season. So this was last year um, around mid-November. So, you know, a patient goes out hiking um, and they have some bad luck and break their ankle um, on the trail. And so, you know, the Overlook Trail is one of the most popular ones. I don't know why, it's very accessible. It's a fun trail, beautiful views, but we get a lot of extremity injuries there. Um, and so in this case, you know, typically an extremity injury is pretty, you know, low key, obviously it's very, pay uh, very painful for the patient, but we can typically just either walk them out or roll them out on the litter. Um, but in the shoulder season, we're always concerned about hypothermia. And so we think about how long is it gonna take to get that patient out? You know, if we're on a trail like Lake Blanche or something, that could be three hours overlook, maybe an hour or so. But still, if it's really cold and the patient's already, you know, injured and in pain and maybe even in shock, who knows, um, that hypothermia can be a really big concern. So in this case, we even considered um, putting life light on standby uh, because of the possibility of, you know, hypothermia setting in. But at the end of the day, um, we sent up the team, they brought lots of uh, blankets and uh, warming, uh, we have warming packs, stuff like that. And they were able to um, uh, take the patient down on the wheel, which is great. That's always, you know, the best case scenario, just being able to roll the patient down. Um, but again, it takes time, you know, it's not exactly the most comfortable or warm ride down. So um, we always encourage people to exercise caution, bring lots of layers. Um, and remember that an extremity injury, it might just be a twisted ankle, but it carries a lot more consequence um, in the shoulder season. Um, okay, so this is Jesse again. Um, I'm going to talk about dehydration and exhaustion, which um, I'm sure as medical professionals, a lot of you are very familiar with. Um, and dehydration and exhaustion do occur year round, um, lots of dehydration in the summer, especially. Um, but I think that they are important to discuss in the shoulder season and as we transition into winter, because like a lot of the things we're talking about today, the shoulder season kind of poses unique risks um, and something as simple as dehydration or exhaustion can become an emergent condition um, you know if if something else is is compounding um, so dehydration is a deficit of water um, it can be kind of more likely to occur in the fall or in the winter as it gets colder um, I know personally, it is really challenging for me to get to myself to drink water in the winter. Um, the last thing I want to do when I'm cold is get out my cold water bottle and have a sip of cold water while it's like snowing outside. Um, so even just from a, a standpoint of drinking water in the first place, it can be challenging. Um, as well as the air is drier and your body needs to work harder to humidify and warm the air as it enters into your lungs. Um, so you're kind of already at a disadvantage trying to stay hydrated uh, in the shoulder season. Um, and so you need to be really, really intentional about kind of replenishing uh, your hydration. Um, exhaustion is a deficit of calories or a depletion of your energy stores or a combo of both. Um, this can be more likely to happen in the fall as it gets colder because your body needs more energy to warm you up in those cold temperatures. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons we love comfort foods. You know, you kind of, in the fall, you want something good and fatty, um, and it's because your body kind of needs that, that extra store um, to try to keep you warm throughout the winter. Um, shoulder season also generally means mixed terrain. So you might go on a hike and experience rock, snow, ice, a little bit of everything. Um, and that can be tricky to navigate. And a lot of times if you do kind of have this mixed terrain, um, navigating over that terrain can be more exhaustive and cause more physical effort to maneuver. Um, both dehydration and exhaustion can generally be treated with rest, uh, replenishing your water um, and electrolytes, getting snacks. Um, but once again, shoulder season poses unique risks um, because when it's cold outside and you're resting, you become a victim of you know, the weather and, and the cold temperatures. Um, 
so for us on the search and rescue team, especially if we get a call for a dehydrated or exhausted um, person, we generally need them to stay put, you know, both so they don't continue to overexert themselves, um, but also so that we can find them and we don't have to go on a wild goose chase around the mountains uh, trying to locate a patient. Um, you know, we want to get to these people as fast as we can to be able to provide treatment. Um, and while, you know, the rest is good for someone who's dehydrated, dehydrated or exhausted, um, it can be worrisome if someone is sitting in cold temperatures for an extended period of time, maybe if the weather changes and it starts raining or snowing. Um, it can put patients uh, at risk of getting, you know, hypothermia um, and other cold weather injuries. Um, and so it's, it's really important to consider that even though dehydration and exhaustion are usually mild cases and generally have um, easy treatment uh, in the shoulder season and the winter, they can become uh, more emergent quickly. Um, so we have some real life examples. Um, our first real life example was on the second of this, or sorry, on the fourth of this year, um, two brothers decided to go hiking up in the foothills of Immigration Canyon and do some hunting up there. Uh, they were kind of hiking around all day doing their hunting and uh, after a full day of hiking, one of the brothers declared that he was too tired to hike back to their trailhead and they decided to call search and rescue. Um, for us, you know, as it gets further into winter, the days get shorter and shorter and we kind of have to make a call of, uh, you know, balancing how we're going to get to the patient and how effectively and how we're not going to put our team at risk by putting them um, in cold, dark situations. Uh, so in this case, we were able to call the Department of Public Safety helicopter to assist us. Um, and we also had some teams on snowmobiles, so they didn't have to hike all the way to the, the brothers. Um, and with this combo, we were able to get the brothers back uh, safe and sound, get all their equipment, and um, they didn't end up needing to go uh, to the hospital. They had mild enough cases that, you know, extracting them was enough. Um, we had another case that actually happened just last week um, on the 23rd. We had two uh, teenagers that decided to go uh, backpack up at White Pine Lake. Um, the temperatures, as we all know, have been really, really cold the last few days. And because of those cold temperatures, they weren't able to cook. Um, and one of the kids got sick in the middle of the night. They decided to try to hike out really, really early, but that combination of not having fuel and being sick uh, and probably dehydrated at that point was a very, very bad combination when you have to continue to exert yourself in freezing temperatures to get out of the backcountry. Um, and so they called search and rescue and uh, luckily we were able to find them easily because they were right on the trail um, and warm them up and get them all taken care of. Um, but yeah, it's just, it goes to show that really these easy situations can become a lot more tricky when you start adding in crazy weather and the cold um, and you know all the unexpected things that can happen in the shoulder season. Awesome yeah so to kind of expand upon that a little more um, another thing we're concerned about in the fall specifically is um, those unexpected conditions you know like we showed before the weather and the precipitation can change really quickly so, you know, whereas in the summer, if you hurt your ankle, you can probably just sit it out, you know, wait for a while and you'll be fine. You can even sit out overnight and probably be fine. Um, but in the fall, it's a little more concerning when you get those immobilizing injuries. So when we look at the conditions, um, especially this time of year, we have a lot of ice and snow in random places and you can't always be sure if the trail's clear um, or if there's new snow or ice. And so again, to kind of reiterate that, you know, we, our most common injury is extremity injuries and ankle injuries, and that's probably not going to kill you, but hypothermia can or a big fall can. Um, and so we think a lot about um, in the fall when you're going out to really be aware of the conditions, you know, now at high elevations, you should probably be expecting to see snow or ice. Um, you just never know. And so again, this is a huge prevention thing. You know, you can't really prevent yourself from slipping and falling, um, but you can just be prepared. And so one thing we really love on the team is micro spikes, especially this time of year, you know, you can go out in your tennis shoes or in your boots um, and just have a pair of micro spikes in your back. 
uh, in your pack in your pack and you can just throw them on over your shoes anytime um, it's probably also a great time of year to not be hiking in tevas anymore i love hiking in my sandals but um it'd be hard to throw micro spikes on over sandals and so just little things like that to be prepared um you know can really help you when you encounter these um unexpected conditions when you're up in the mountains and so this one was another really recent one um a person was doing part of the whirl, um, the Wasatch Ultimate Ridgeline link up, uh, which kind of goes around Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, and so this trail or route is about 30 miles and involves a lot of ridgeline, um, very exposed ridgeline. And so um, this uh, incident happened right after we had that kind of little first snowstorm a couple weeks ago. Um, and so they were above the Lake Blanche area on the ridgeline um, and didn't expect there to be that much ice or snow up there. Um, and not 100% sure of the mechanism that happened, but all they know is that suddenly the patient ended up slipping and falling. And because of the exposure up there, ended up being 100 to 150 feet, um, a pretty significant fall with pretty significant injuries. Um, and so again, the time of year really compounded this um, specific incident. Not that a big fall wouldn't be um, a big deal any time of year, but in this case, it was especially concerning because of the weather and time of day. So person, you know, ended up falling around 11 a.m. It took, as you can see, about five hours for the whole operation to be done. And by that time, you're kind of pushing into nighttime. And so if you think about a patient with serious injuries, um, you know, shock coming into play, you really don't want that person sitting out overnight. And so this was a um, great usage of the helicopter. You know, we want that patient to be out really quick. It would take many, many hours to roll a patient down um, in the wheel from that location. You know, the Lake Blanche Trail alone is about three hours, maybe four um, on the wheel. And then you think about being, you know, several hundred vertical feet above that um, in the scree field. And that would be um, not a great situation to put that patient in. And so, yeah, this is another example of, you know, fall conditions um, really creating extreme conditions um, just to be aware of when you're out and about, especially when doing um, kind of more high risk activities there. And so um, one of the big problems with the shoulder season is obviously shorter days. Um, so as we transition into the winter, our days are going to get really, really short. Um, I know I'm not looking forward to uh, daylight savings this weekend. <laughs> um, before you know it, it'll be dark at 4 p.m. Um, and then for outdoor people like ourselves, it's like, oh my gosh, now I can't go outside after work anymore. Um, Anyways, it poses a unique risk um, for search and rescue and for the shoulder season um, because people generally get really used to and comfortable with traveling in the summer um, where you have those big long days. And uh, as the days start getting shorter, um, I think a lot of people generally don't think about sunset time, especially because it kind of works on an exponential curve where you know, we might only use, lose two or three minutes of daylight a day, but as we get further into the winter, um, we're going to start losing more and more time every day. Uh, so people who used to be able to just, you know, start a hike at 3 or 4 p.m. Um, and be done before the sun went down uh, can't really do that anymore. And the problem just gets worse as, it, as um, we get closer to winter. So uh, what happens for a lot of people is once it starts getting dark people, uh, you become more prone to lose the trail. Um, it starts getting colder earlier because you can't see, uh, you might slip and fall more easily. And then obviously because of uh, the cold, you are at risk for hypothermia. Um, as you can see from this slide, we have this happen a lot. Um, we get a lot of calls for lost people um, and they usually call us like right around sunset time um, because they've kind of realized that they're uh, in a little bit of trouble. Um, this is another one of those things that is really, really easy to prevent. Uh, you know, bring a headlamp, be prepared with extra layers, plan your days out so that you can be done with your activities um, before the sun sets. Um, and yeah, just, you know, try not to be out when it gets dark. You put yourself at risk for so many other things. <laughs> um, so we also have some real life examples of this because it's a very common call. Um, we have two from last year that were just kind of back to back. Um, the one on the top right was October 8th. 
and uh, we were called out around 7 45 p.m so you know right around that sunset time just about after um for uh, an 18 year old who had gotten lost on Lone Peak um, and if you've ever hiked Lone Peak you know that's a very very long hike <laughs> um, and as you so he started midday um, and was able to hike quite a ways but uh, and got to the summit but on his way down um, became lost and disoriented with the fading light um, he ended up in Little Willow Drainage and tried to kind of make his way out from there. Um, but that area gets really, really thick with brush. Um, even though a lot of parts on that trail, you can see the city, uh, there may not be a clear path down to the valley. Um, so once he decided that he couldn't make it any farther, he called search and rescue and we were able to send a team up um, the trail uh, and then basically try to bushwhack until we could find him. Um, you know, we use generally phone pings and the patient's reported location to try to find them. Um, but that's another thing with the dark is uh, we can't see um, a patient as well when it's dark. If you have a headlamp, it's really, really wise to bring because we'll be able to see you in the dark. Um, but yeah, the darkness can also just make it harder for us to locate you. Um, <clears throat> In this case, we used the Department of Public Safety helicopter to try to find a nice path. Um, and we were able to identify a way out of the drainage that was less difficult and didn't require a ton of hiking back up around into the trail. Um, but as you can see, this was also a really long uh, call. We got called out around 8 p.m. and ended at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, so definitely watch out for getting lost. Um, our second example, we were called out the next day around 8.15 p.m. for a couple who had decided to summit Mount Superior. They started around noon, but once again, um, got off route on the descent and got lost. Once it got dark, they were very cold. Um, and then what happens is if you don't plan to be out at dark, you don't bring an extra layer. Uh, so that's kind of what happened to this couple um, and they, <clears throat> they were um, also able to have assistance from the DPS helicopter to uh, locate the couple. Um, and we were able to extract them with the helicopter instead of sending um, a whole nother team to uh, try and assist them. Um, both, you know, ended up well, but were situations that could have been prevented with some more uh, planning and bringing of extra gear. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide poisoning. Um, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with carbon monoxide poisoning. I know that I have a um, detector in my house to make sure that there's no stray carbon monoxide floating around. Um, but these can also be a danger in the backcountry. So as it gets colder, um, if you decide to camp, either in a tent or a snow cave or what have you, um, you still need to make sure that you are cooking in a well-ventilated area. Um, even though you're tempted to cook inside your tent because it's really cold outside, um, this buildup of carbon monoxide from your cooking equipment can um, cause you know, poisoning, asphyxiation, all sorts of really bad stuff. Um, and generally in the back country, we don't have oxygen therapy to give you. Um, so that can really escalate quickly. Um, carbon dioxide poisoning acts very, very similarly, but can be instigated just by sleeping in a poorly ventilated area. Um, so basically for both of these, just make sure your shelter is very well ventilated. Um, for carbon dioxide poisoning, I just have an anecdote to share. Um, so I was leading a trip to Yellowstone National Park for the University of Utah's Outdoor Adventures program, where we take students on like different outdoor excursions. And we knew that the temperatures were going to be really cold. So we made sure to bring our full blown winter tents, um, double sleeping bags for all the participants. Uh, we made everyone sleep with their tent at full capacity, you know, so if it's a three person's tent, we are shoving three people in there. So no one uh, had to worry about being cold at night. Um, and we felt really confident that our participants would sleep well um, and comfortably, even though we knew it was gonna snow. Um, then kind of in the middle of the night, uh, I wake up 
and my co-leader, who I know really well, um, is snoring really loud, which is strange, um, you know, and I, I've slumped with tents in her before, and I'm like, huh, she's never woken me up with her snoring, this is weird. Um, and as I'm kind of in this like foggy haze, I'm like, oh wow, like it feels kind of hard to breathe. That's, that's strange. And after what probably took way too long, I realized that it had snowed enough that our vents were covered, um, that area between the rain fly and the ground was covered, and so we weren't getting any new air into our tent. So I threw open the door of the tent, you know, let all the cold air in with the oxygen and uh, ran around to all the participants' tents and make sh made sure they had uh, their vents all cleared and everything. Um, but it was, it was kind of, you know, a scary occurrence. And um, even though we thought we were so well prepared for winter camping, we still even made this mistake. Um, and luckily everyone was fine. I don't think anyone besides me and one other tent of leaders noticed. Um, but it could have had very, a very, very bad outcome um, if we hadn't, you know, woken up and, and corrected our mistake. So last little topic we're going to talk about is specifically hypothermia. A lot of times with the things we actually go to, hypothermia is not what we get called out for, but it's something that we eventually have to start dealing with. And so as all of you have pretty much learned for pretty much all of your medical certifications, hypothermia by definition is an abnormally low body temperature. Usually we start counting anyone as hypothermic when their internal core body temperature goes below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. About that point, that's when we start kind of building in that shivering mechanism. And then we start going down further from there. So a lot of times when anytime we get hypothermia, it means our heat loss is ex exceeding our metabolic heat production and conservation. So meaning no matter what we're doing, we might be producing heat and everything that, but we're losing it at such a quick rate that we're not able to keep our own bodies warm. While we have these sort of hypothermic patients, we can now actually figure out kind of where on the spectrum they are about what type of hypothermia you get. When we're more on that mild sort of rate, so anything below that 95 degrees internal body temperature, that's when we get people that start shivering. We kind of start get that thing where there's like their fingers start to get really cold, their toes get cold. They're just kind of having that like, I'm freezing, I'm starting to get miserable sort of state. Whereas if we get our core temperature even lower, we're usually around about 93.2 to 96 degrees Fahrenheit, that's when we start getting into that more moderate state of hypothermia. That's where we get our mumbles and umbles. We lose coordination. We don't start thinking clearly. Everything gets super foggy. Okay? We don't make the best decisions at this time. Okay, Because essentially we start getting to the point where we can't take care of ourselves. If we keep progressing even further down there, our core body gets below 86 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we're more in that severe hypothermia kind of loop. And that's where we get really bad problems. This is where we have people that start to look like they're essentially dead. They're sitting there, they're completely frozen, trying to get a pulse on them will take a super long time because all of their metabolic functions, all of their heart rate, respiratory rate starts to decrease to the point where they essentially look like they're dead. And so that's what we're going to try and avoid as much as humanly possible in any of these situations. So a lot of times, depending on what type of hypothermia they have, how severe on that whole spectrum they are, we treat it in different ways. If we're still back at that more mild hypothermia, then we can easily reverse it by basically doing what we call the feed and beat principle. So we give them lots of high calorie foods, lots of warm liquids, hot chocolate is a really good one at this point if they're not lactose intolerant or anything like that. We give them really high calorie hot food and we basically have them run around, do jumping jacks, do laps around a tent, anything like that. So essentially we get to bring in those calories as fuel and then we start burning those calories. So we start using that metabolic rate and everything to start creating that heat to heat, and heat them back up. Usually if they can figure out that themselves, they're able to really deal with everything and move on their merry way. If they're more in that moderate state and they're not able to really maintain their own airway or anything like that, then we don't want to start like pumping random calories and food into their mouth because we then create a lovely airway obstruction. That's going to just make our situation worse. So in these cases, we really want to try and warm them up. 
And so using any sort of hot water bottles, heat packs, warm blankets, lots of different layers, start wrapping them up like a big, huge burrito. Can okay, I get a hypo wrap going? That's really essentially what we wanna start doing at this point. Once they start getting really warmed up and able to move, we're still in that moderate state, then maybe we can get them out on their own. Otherwise, we are probably gonna to have to lift them and transport them. When we're more in that severe state, then we really want to be careful with them. So we don't want to jostle or adjust them because we can end them sending them into cardiac arrest or sending them to any sort of shock afterward. The main thing with a lot of these treatments here is making sure that we are providing heat to them. We shouldn't make the assumption, especially when we have moderate to severe hypothermia, that they can warm up their body on their own. They're in such a severe state that their own thermoregulation just doesn't work anymore. So we definitely want to make sure that we are pumping heat to them and not doing that expectation of, oh, if I wrap them up and leave them in a bed for a while, they'll heat themselves up. That whole internal burner has kind of died out. So we need to make sure that we pump that heat onto them. Okay. Usually our best way for trying to treat hypothermia is preventing it in the first place. Okay. Proactive measurements is the best philosophy for everything in the medical field. So a lot of times we wanna make sure that anytime we're going out into any sort of variable temperatures or cold weather or even out in the winter, which is right here around the corner, we wanna make sure that we protect ourselves and that we're prepared for any sort of burials. Meaning that we bring any sort of appropriate clothing. This is where we go off of that layering principle where we make sure that first layer on here is any sort of moisture wicking material. Then we have a nice puffy insulating layer and then a nice outer shell that's going to protect from any sort of water or precipitation coming in and affecting us. After that, we need to be very attentive to ourselves as well as any others. So if they start feeling cold, we start seeing people start to shiver. Some people start complaining that their toes or their finger, fingers feel norm, weird and like numb. Okay, we need to make sure we get on those people immediately. Okay, don't be the hero that's like, well, if everyone else is still hiking out, then I guess I'll just suck it up. No, because that's where we start progressing down the hill and start, things start getting majorly worse. So we need to make sure that once you see a problem, we stop and fix it. Because if we don't, then it's gonna just progress and get majorly worse. After that, proper food and water intake, just making sure we stay nice and healthy, hydrated and fueled. It's gonna make all the world of difference. Okay? Make sure you stay nice and dry, especially your feet, because no one likes hiking around in cold frozen toes. Okay, that just makes any trip an immediate failure <laughs> and a miserable time. Okay, as well as that's gonna majorly contribute to any sort of heat loss. When you're soaking wet, that cold and all that awful, awful precipitation that's on you is just gonna freeze. It's not gonna wick away like it does in the summer. You'll sit there and freeze and you'll turn into an actual literal popsicle. Um, otherwise, avoid any sort of alcohol, caffeine, recreational drugs, any sort of artificial drugs, stuff like that because those are gonna help constrict or affect your circulation okay, or dehydrate you further, which is going to, again, make your situation worse. Otherwise, good basis for everything, don't tolerate numbness. Okay? I know a lot of us sit out there and go, okay, my fingers are numb, whatever, okay? but that's gonna to lead to some other major issues. Okay? Some real examples we've actually had of this, both of these are from this year. Our first one is here on the left. This happened back on January 3rd, Okay, not very much shoulder season midwinter, but this is a case of actually hypothermia. So we actually had an individual that is normally from California, I believe at this time he was about 17 years old, decided to take a hike from Mill Creek Canyon over into Park City. Okay, the only reason that we found out that there was a problem is because the individual that he was supposed to have dinner with that night called it in that he was missing and that he didn't show up there at night. What ended up happening is we did a full blown search through Mill Creek Canyon basically searching any single place that he could have gone to because we didn't get an exact location about which hiking trail he went to. Eventually we could figure out a little bit more because he got dropped off by an Uber. So the Uber was able to tell us where they dropped him off. Did another full search up in that area. We ended up finding him in a tree well where he had stayed the night. And by the time we had gotten to him, he had fully stripped off his shoes, he had gotten rid of his coat, and he was just sitting there completely bundled in a little ball by himself. He had moderate hypothermia as well as severe frostbite to his feet, and he was not very coherent anytime we were trying to talk to him. So initially when we were called, we were looking for just a 
like a lost hiker, but it turned into, it was very much a hypothermic case, just based off of kind of what happened and what we saw and found for him. Our next example is one that actually Jesse talked about earlier. This is the one that happened last week. Okay. Again, it was two 17-year-old boys that decided to go up to White Pine, spend a nice three-day little camping trip up there. They didn't make it past day one because that night they had determined that it was too cold for them to actually make dinner or they didn't want to, so they went to bed without any food. So one, we have the fact that we talked about that dehydration as well as not, like lack of nutrition. So there's no way that metabolic kind of thing was going. And so they actually spent a horrible, horrible night because they didn't bring enough layers. They didn't bring anything. Our patient only brought jeans and a puffy, which was not good because it ended up freezing that night. And so they ended up having a miserable night or freezing cold, decided about five in the morning that they were going to hike out. And because he was so cold, had no fuel, anything like that, he cramped out as well as froze. So we ended up having him sit down where he was got up to him and when we got to him he was severely shivering and so we were about to be in that little bit mild moving into that kind of more moderate hypothermia at that point so our immediate treatment at that point was just making sure we got him all warmed up making sure he was okay got him transported got him out of there and so a lot of these calls we don't initially go for a hypothermic patient but when we show up that's a major factor that contributes to a lot of these injuries and can make them significantly worse so with everything that we have said so far showing you that lots of these shoulders like type of seasons have lots of different injuries how exactly can we prevent them and what can we do to help prevent them okay so the first thing is we can bring materials that'll help us so what exactly do we want to bring most of the time on our adventures so the first thing is any sort of GPS or navigation device. Okay, if you know exactly where you are and you can tell us where you are, then that's going to just make it a lot easier for us to get to you. As well as if you are really good at navigation and you have a map, you can find your own way out that way. So having those resources on hand are always good no matter what. Making sure you have good food and water, okay, that again is just going to make sure you have good fuel, you're hydrated for whatever activities you're doing, and you don't end up making your health decrease. After that, we want sun protection. This is especially the case if you're going out in any sunny. This does apply in winter because snow burn is a thing. It reflects off the snow, just burns your eyeballs and even inside your mouth which I have had for a person before and they did not have a fun time. So making sure you have adequate sun protection as well as the next one out there, making sure you have appropriate layers. Okay, I do agree that maybe in the middle of the shoulder season moving over from winter to spring or we're in more of that spring season, that bring a foam full blown puffy and everything might be a little bit of overkill, but having at least some sort of rain shell and gloves so you're that way or at least protected from any sort of rain, water, anything like that from hitting you, and as well as keeping your hands nice and warm, are gonna be a major factor that's gonna to add to your comfort level, especially if someone needs to come out there and get you and you're sitting around for a while. After that, good foot, like any sort of footwear works out well. Now is about the time where we should have full blown shoes as well as good hiking boots that have a really good ankle on them. So we protect from any of those twisted ankle injuries as we slip on those nice cute leaves. And after that, making sure we have headlamps and batteries, okay? making sure we have a way to illuminate our way during that night, as well as if our headlamp ends up dying, we have a way to power back to it. Okay? We don't want to go out there and just be like, I have a headlamp, but it's dead, so now it's useless. So making sure we have ways to actually replenish that headlamp is really good. After that, just a basic fire starter. So this be cotton balls meshed in with a bunch of Vaseline. This can be lint you pulled out of your dryer and put in a little baggie. Okay, because if you're gonna be out there overnight, then starting a little tiny fire, again, to add a little bit of heat to you as well as illumination, it's gonna be a really, really nice. After that, repair tools for any activity that you're doing. So if you're out there mountain biking, bring things to repair your mountain bike. If you're out there going to go fishing, the things to fix, like fix your fishing pole, okay? Whatever activity you're doing, bring the repair kit that is most appropriate for whatever activity you're doing. After that, super basic first aid kit. Okay, this can be even stuff that's just here for bandaging wounds. Okay, this can be band-aids and just little things like that. So you at least have some basis to treat whatever minor problems you might have in gum. I don't expect you to bring a full down like tension splint, all this sort of stuff going on, but just something little that can at least help at least 
a moderate amount is going to be good. And after that, we want to bring some sort of cover. And what I mean by cover is some sort of like a little bit of a makeshift shelter. I don't expect everyone to bring like a bivy or a tent anytime they go outside, but having just a basic large trash bag or one of those metallic emergency blankets is going to be really nice for you because that at least gives you a little bit of shelter from the outside and will retain a little bit of heat on you. Okay. And then again, our principles are anytime before you go outside, always have a plan and tell someone about it so we don't end up going on again that wild goose chase trying to find where you are on an entire mountain after that check the weather forecast a lot of the things that happen in the cases that we go to are because people didn't check the weather and they're unprepared for any of the weather comes flying in okay again weather has that very variable weather so it changes on a dime so at least having a general idea about the weather that's going to appear is going to help you plan accordingly again be willing to turn around if you don't feel comfortable or you know that it's about to turn bad then just turn around okay don't be that guy that absolutely has to summit okay we've responded about three times on that guy in the last month <laughs> and it wasn't a fun experience for anyone so please, if you don't feel comfortable or you don't have the supplies to make it, okay, just turn back around. It's significantly easier to make your way back down the mountain than get to the top and have to wait for us to come and get you. Otherwise, speak up if you have concerns. Okay, don't just suffer fest your way through everything. If you have a problem, speak to the group because your problem becomes the group's problem. And if you just sit there and suffer, then it's going to become a bigger and bigger issue that ultimately is going to land you guys in really bad situations. And with that said, that is the conclusion to our lovely lecture here. We are going to now open it to the floor to any questions you have for us. First of all, say that was a great presentation. I loved every minute of it. Thank you. How often do you see people going out? Are, are all of, pretty much every one of your rescues um, related to people who are not prepared? Would you say like that's a 90% or a huge percent of that? Or is it more just the unexpected? I think most of it probably is the unexpected. Um, and then being prepared is just a factor in making people more comfortable or preventing those secondary things like hypothermia, exposure. Um, because, you know, you can't really predict an ankle injury. You know, there's some of the cases that we get like, okay, I'm going hiking in Mill Creek in the fall, there's snow on the ground, but I'm gonna wear my tennis shoes and I'm not gonna bring micro spikes. And that's an easy mistake to make. You don't expect the snow. And in that case, you could say, sure, you could have been a little more prepared, but you know, things happen and we accept that. That's why we're on the team. It's awesome to be able to go out and help people. But I think a lot of the prevention and preparation is in helping you be more comfortable and more prepared if that unexpected thing happens. And there's always just the random freak accident. Like a lot of times we have climbers that end up having their ropes randomly cut or they end up falling. And those are things that they necessarily can't prepare for, but they can always do that mitigation for. Um, so the ones that we mostly call it to are the ones that are just like, oh, I ended up hiking up here. I brought a tiny little water bottle, didn't think it was going to be this far, and now I don't have any water, and I'm dehydrated and tired, and I can't make it down. So I'd probably say about 75%, because we always have to contribute to that factor of just freak accidents that happen. Right. And I have a quick question. Um, so just thinking of people who maybe are moved, because you know a lot of people move to Utah for the outdoors. Um, or maybe people that are, are novices, what kind of community resources do they have that can help teach them what they need? Um, Janet made a comment that uh, her daughter took a backpack or backcountry backpacking course at the U and said, by the way, you guys should be the one to teach that because I agree you are amazing at this. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of things, you know, can we put out or what kind of resources maybe can we put out as injury prevention that can give people maybe a class or tips and tricks uh, if they're just going out. Cause I think a lot of people just think, Oh, everybody goes hiking here. I I'm going to go and, and don't really know what they're getting into. Yeah. So REI has a, like a really good series of stuff that are specifically geared to what sort of activity you're doing. So they have like re bike repair sort of classes. They have backcountry things, how to do winter backpacking, um, the University of Utah has a really good outdoors program that they specifically have like classes that you can go to that teach you how to do specific sort of outdoor activities that work really well. You can do like a winter backpacking course, you can go on a specific climbing course, all those sort of things. Um, 
But for me personally, and I'll let my colleagues speak after I'm done with this, but um, I would say just taking at least a basic first aid class is going to be a huge thing. And if you're specifically oriented to doing anything outside, then I would go for what we call either a WUFA or a WUFR course. And that just means wilderness first aid or wilderness first responder. And so we have classes specifically here at the U that either are run through NOLS, which is the National Outdoor Leadership School, or we have other ones that are in place from other different sort of companies. So like Backcountry Pulse and things like that. And those are just quick little courses you can take over a weekend or just a quick little like week situation that teaches you all of these sort of first aid skills, but gear it towards being outside. So being like, well, I have this patient with me here who has a busted up ankle, but I'm miles and miles away from any sort of hospital. So how do I deal with them for a long term sort of time? So it just gears it to being, how do I treat these people out in the middle of nowhere with very minimal to no resources? Yeah, I 100% agree with Darby. And I think it kind of also goes back to that first question about are the call outs because of being unprepared or because of something unexpected. And so with the unexpected things, those are often people who did all the right things. You know, they go out with experienced friends, they're prepared, but they, you know, hit a tree and broke their leg. And what are you going to do? You can't prevent that really. Um, but I think when we have the unprepared people, it's an active versus passive kind of thing. You know, if you're not actively seeking out those REI classes or actively asking your friends, how do you reach those people? And I think that's something we can do better as a county overall, you know, whether it's signs at the trailhead or, you know, announcements on Facebook, like how do we reach people who aren't actively seeking out the information? How do we warn them about, you know, hiking Mount Olympus at 2 p.m. in the middle of July? So I think that's a great question and something we all need to, yeah, think about and do better. Yeah, and um, I agree with both Darby and Sophia. I think that one of um, the things that the Salt Lake County Search and Rescue Team tries to do to reach those people who um, aren't actively seeking resources is, uh, you know, we try to post resources on our social media. So we have our Instagram and our Facebook, um, as well as an actual website page where we try to uh, remind people the 10 essentials you should have in your backpack or, you know, tips and tricks of, of being safe in shoulder season. Um, and though, you know, that, that also can be more difficult to find because you have to be following us to see those. Um, we try to at least get those out there because not everyone has um, a, like the resources to maybe afford a class or the time to you know, spend a couple nights a week um, taking a woofer. Um, while I would really, really recommend those, we understand that that's not realistic for everyone. Um, another thing that we try to do is we try to do a little bit of community outreach. Um, you know, maybe one or two Saturdays a month, we'll have a couple team members go to a trailhead and pass out water, um, maybe, you know, a search and rescue whistle or something like that and try to engage with the community. Um, which I really, really like doing because uh, that's like a really, really good way to interact directly with the people where you can affect change in the back country. Um, but it definitely is hard trying to reach the entire, you know, Salt Lake County community and, and educate them on how to be safe. Um, we just hope that our first time meeting them is not, you know, when we're rescuing them from a mountain. <laughs> I agree. And as injury prevention people, um, we're happy to help. If we, if you ever want us to help out or if you have anything going on that uh, we can assist with, uh, obviously part of our job. And I am happy to get out on the trails anytime. So <laughs> you're never going to say get me to say, no, I don't want to go into the mountains. Um, we did have <laughs> one question for you guys. Is there, is one cell service carrier better than others for calling out when you're in the back country? That was from Sharif. I threw in the chat that I've heard in Little Cottonwood, Verizon is better because they just installed a couple new towers. Um, luckily, we get cell service most places here, but there's still some peaks and valleys you can get into with no service. And in that case, you really need just like one of the spots, you know, or the little Garmin that can send out um, an emergency signal. And we do get call outs from people with those devices. So if you're concerned or tend to go out a lot um, out of service, it can be a really great thing to have on you. Yeah, Mill Creek Canyon is notorious for being out of cell service. And so making sure if you're up there to have one of those devices, because usually the only time you can get service is if you're going back down to the road or you're all the way at the peak. So. I have a question. Do people get charged anything when you guys go to rescue them? And then how, where do you guys get funding? 
Um, so we are a volunteer based organization. So everyone on the search and rescue team volunteers their time. Um, so any rescue that we do uh, is at no cost to the person that is rescued. Um, we are funded through community uh, contributions. So, you know, donations from the community. Um, I don't know if any of you guys heard of our dog rescues that we've done. We've done two rescues of dogs in the past two years, and those tend to be really, really big drivers of donations. <laughs> um, but yeah, we provide our, our service at no cost to the community, and, and thankfully our community is able to support us through donations. But one thing to consider is that if we call in an outside mm. medical service, like if you go down the valley, you know, in a unified fire ambulance or if Life Flight um, ends up taking you to the hospital, you do get charged for that as those are medical um, transport services. But our specific rescue, um, yeah, is at no cost, like Jesse said. We still have a few minutes, so please feel free to ask more questions. I'm just going to launch this end of presentation poll um, while everybody else is kind of finishing that up. How long is the longest um, most of you who volunteer? How often do you, is the, do people stay on? Are, are there people who've been on this group, volunteer group for decades? Is it kind of a fleeting thing or is it kind of a mixed bag? Um, I would say it's kind of a mixed bag. There are people who have been on the team for a really, really long time and you know are just, like they have the most valuable experience and are, are so fun to talk to is um, a member who is on the newer side. Um, but then there are, you know, people who don't make it through the probationary period. Um, Darby and I are, we've been on the team for about a year now, and that entails a nine month probationary period where you're not technically a full member. Um, you know, they're still kind of trying you out and making sure that uh, you can get all the training you need to be an effective member, um, as well as make sure that you're dedicated enough to contribute to the team in a meaningful way. Um, and I think from Darby and I's like starting class, I think about half of us are left. Um, and even one of the members who made it all, through, all the way through the probationary period uh, has left. And you know, that can be for various life reasons. People move, people decide that they don't have enough time anymore. Um, but I mean, we even have members who will take a year or two leave of absence and come back because I think it's a, a very strong community and like such a fun way to volunteer. Yeah, it's very dedicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we like it. <laughs> cool. Awesome. All right. Uh, if nobody else has any questions, we're going to give you guys a few minutes back. Um, thank you, ladies, so much uh, for taking the time to present today. Uh, so much great information, um, especially since we have such an outdoor group, I think, in our area. So we appreciate you guys giving us your time and all the information. And again, this will be on our YouTube playlist, so we will be able to send that out. Um, you guys will be able to have that and then the rest of the group can can watch it as well. So again, thank you guys very much for your time. Thanks for having us. Have a good rest. Thank of you so much. Yeah, thank you guys.